Hello, and welcome to this video where I'm going to go through and sort of debrief the first exam from Physics 132 for the spring 2021 semester. Um, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the purpose of this video. I want to go through each question on the exam and explicitly connect it to what we did in class. In the reflection, it was still clear that for some folks, the connection between the various elements of the course was not fully clear. And so I really want to make that explicit to everybody. So just as a recap, the units begin with readings and homework. And these readings and homework are meant to help you develop a base level of understanding. Full mastery is not expected, nor is that you've developed a full complete picture. That, that's not what the goal of that assignment is. Your goal for the readings and the homework is to learning some of the background information, like the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, defining some of the key terms, such as what is a wavelength, master the variables in the fundamental principles like p equals h over lambda and then review material from biology or chemistry or physics 131 like conservation of energy by doing these things in the reading and the homework we save time in class to tackle more complex ideas the these are followed as you now know by the quizzes and these are really just there to make sure that folks actually learned the material from the homework and, and you know, just didn't get too much help and also sort of prime the pump and, and set the stage for a given day's discussion. You've probably noticed by now that the results of a quiz on a given day are actually commonly used later in that same class. Speaking of class, we then move on to class where we practice applying the ideas from homework to develop that mastery and to develop that cohesive picture that I don't expect you to get from the homework. And so that we have time to talk about explicitly the various problem solving techniques. For example, not listing all of your knowns and unknowns and then trying to find a formula. Instead, listing uh, the fundamental principles at play, thinking about your situation and then trying to decide from there how to begin. And also it gives us time to develop, like I said, more complex ideas that are not covered in the reading, such as particle in a box that wasn't in your reading at all, but was developed in class instead. Uh, I'll remind you there are additional practice problems. Uh, these are worksheets on Moodle and they're optional. The reason I like to make it optional is different people need additional practice on different things. I, I don't wanna require this level of additional work uh, for people. Um, if you got, you know, uh, the ideas behind converting between wavelength and energy from class, great. You don't need to do that worksheet. But if you want a little bit more practice, those are available for you. And then finally, the exam, where I am checking your understanding to see if you can apply the ideas and problem solving techniques that we've discussed in class to new situations. And I want them to be new situations because like I said in the syllabus, I know this is your last physics class that almost all of you will ever take. So I don't want this to just be a hoop. I want this to be a course that's helpful, that gives you information that you can then apply to your other courses within your major or your profession. So if after watching this video, you're still unclear on how class and homework and all these other things connect, please, 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 uh, come and see me because I want to help you be successful in this course. Uh, before we begin, I also want to remind you a little bit about the exams. So I mentioned the exams are going to ask you to apply the ideas to new situations, and you've now seen this. And as a consequence, I don't actually expect folks to get 100 on my exams. Um, the reason for this is that Problem solving is hard. So this is a diagram of something known as Bloom's taxonomy and Bloom himself never actually represented it like a pyramid this way, but you'll often see it represented as such. And basically your homework and your quizzes are focused on these levels here. Just the basic 
remembering of facts and understanding. Whereas the exams and the in-class activities are much more about these so-called higher order thinking processes, applying, using the knowledge gained in new ways, you know, exactly what I said, um, analyzing. So breaking a concept apart and connecting them to each other and these types of things. So that's harder. That's much, much harder than just understanding or remembering. And so I do not expect perfection on my exams because they are more challenging than just recalling uh, stuff that you have memorized. Okay. So how do I come up with my grading scale as I actually think about what an A student should be able to get, what a B student should be able to get, and so on and so forth on each of the individual categories. And my expectation is that my A student should be able to average about a 78, given these other um, averages on these other uh, course components. If you do better on those other course components, you can have a lower exam average, but this is just sort of a guideline. And the exam average for this exam was 75%. So, you know, pretty much right on target, especially for a first exam where folks are still kind of getting used to the structure. Another reason I do not expect perfection on my exams can be seen very clearly with these notes from the reflection, where I've, you know, these are the graphs where I asked you to say, which question would, do you think was the easiest and which question did you think was the hardest? And you can see very clearly that there is quite a bit of spread in which problems people thought were the hardest. And similarly, the easiest, there, there was quite a bit of spread on those. This is because people's brains work differently. People are bringing different experiences into the course. People are just different. And since they're bringing different things, people are gonna find different problems easier or harder. So since pe different people will find different problems to be challenging, I don't actually expect anyone to really get all of them. So now let's start uh, going through the exam. We're going to begin with problem one, which was by far voted uh, the easiest problem by the most people. So we'll begin with that one. And here is the problem where the photon goes from the wave on the left to the wave on the right. Uh, we can see that the amplitude of the wave has increased, which means that the number of photons has increased. Um, similarly, we can see that the wavelength has shrunk. And so since the wavelength has shrunk by P equals H over lambda and E equals PC, if the wavelength goes down, the momentum goes up. If the momentum goes up, the energy goes up. And so the energy of each photon has um, increased. And the speed has stayed the same because they're all photons. Uh, and they are all traveling at the speed of light, C. And so since they're all traveling at the speed of light, the speed must be the same. Uh, there was quite a bit of practice with this type of idea in unit one, day five, slides nine and 14. I did uh, some ranking where you ranked uh, by number of part, uh, by momentum, and we had a clicker question about the number of particles. And then there was an explicit question about photon speed and how they're all traveling at C on unit one, day six, slide seven. And then there was a nice uh, next time problem at the end of day six, where I asked you to rank by energy, a proton, an electron, and a photon. So these are some of the problems that really should have prepared you for this particular exam question. Now we're moving on to problem number two, which was identified by several people as being one of the more challenging questions. So I'll go through it a little bit. Uh, here we are looking at energy all over the place. So we're definitely going to think about 
conservation of energy here. Uh, no work, as always, until we get to unit three. What do we have in our initial state? Uh, we have an electron with energy E1, where E1 was in fact given. So the initial state is E1 is 68 keV, or whatever it was for your particular exam. What do we have at the end? We have a speed, a, an electron with some speed. So it's going to have a kinetic energy of one half mvf squared, where vf was was given in the in the problem, and then we have a photon leaving the system. Now, when you put in the mass of the electron and the given speed, this and convert to keV, which is what I did. Um, it also works perfectly well if you convert the keV to joules. This is eight keV. And so the correct answer is 60. So that is the right answer. You do the algebra, you've got uh, 8 keV minus 68 keV equals minus E gamma. Multiply everything through by a negative sign, minus 8 plus 68 is the energy of the photon. Uh, what problems were particularly pertinent to this problem? Well, the photoelectric effect problem on unit 1D9 was actually a more complicated version because the electron had some potential energy at the beginning. But one that was really, really similar was the Compton scattering uh, problem from unit 1D10, the very last problem we did in the unit. Uh, in that one, it's, it's basically this Bremsstrahlung process backwards. Instead of an electron emitting a photon, it's, in a sense, a photon emitting an electron as it goes by. So basically the same problem, but you know, flipped around. Problem three, you had either an electron and a proton or neutron with the same wavelength. It didn't actually matter which version you had. Uh, which other part of properties must be the same? Well, if the wavelengths are the same, their momenta must also be the same. Nothing else. Uh, the mass is wildly different between electrons and protons. You can see that on your equation sheet. It's a factor of about 2,000 times, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. And because of those mass differences, their speeds will be different if their moments are the same, and their energies will also be different. Uh, once again, Unit 1, day 5 was really hammering this point home, that it was the momentum that's the same for the different uh, wavelengths. Uh, in this particular problem, all the problem, all the particles with the same wavelength had the same momentum. And then unit one day six, we, we took it that next step and said, yeah, okay, how does the mass matter when we think about the speed? So those should have been the, the problems that really sort of guided you for this particular exam question. And then once again, the next time problem for unit one day six was also helpful. Problem four, we had the electron sitting in E1, and we had a photon with some amount of energy, which was bigger than 12 EV in all cases, come in. The electron could then absorb this energy and become free with some amount of kinetic energy. Uh, in my case, since it's 20 EV and all of these add up to 12, my electron would become free with 8 EV of kinetic energy. So that's what would happen. Um, it is an understandable mistake about the idea of kinetic energy. And so some partial credit was given for uh, just remaining in E1. Um, what would have been good preparation for this? 
the photoelectric electric effect problem on unit one, day nine, slide 11, in particular part D, where if the photon had more than enough energy to escape, what would happen? And the answer was it would escape with some kinetic energy. So very, very similar to this problem um, in that regard. Problem five is also uh, identified as one of the more challenging uh, problems. So go through it. Uh, once again, we are starting with conservation of energy. So no work. E final minus E initial is whatever is emitted. So let's assume the photon is emitted. What do we have in, what types of energy do we have? Well, we might go full 131 on this and just say potential, kinetic, potential, kinetic, e gamma. <clears throat> now, Assuming it maintains the same speed means that the kinetic energies are going to be equal to each other and will uh, subtract out. So all that's left are the potential energies that we need to think about. At the beginning, it is in aluminum. So the potential energy there is minus 4.08 EV. The minus was in your reading and since it was such an important point, I actually reinforced it on the quiz for unit one, day seven. Now, Moodle was a little wonky for this day's quiz, so it didn't uh, get scored, but I did try to emphasize the importance of this, this potential energy of bound electrons is negative. And then the, whoops, I got it backwards. I start in the aluminum. So that's where my 4.08 EV goes. Uh, and then I end up in the platinum, minus 6.35 EV. And from there, I would be able to solve for the energy of the photon. And then with the expression that many of y'all are familiar with from chemistry, which is combining de Broglie, P, e, e equal, P equals H over lambda and E equals PC, I would be able to find the wavelength. And the correct answer for the wavelength was the uh, 546.3 nanometers. Everyone had the same values for this particular problem. Uh, and I did give some partial credit uh, for E because that basically, you would get E if you missed uh, this point that was reinforced on the unit one day seven quiz. Uh, what were the problems that should have helped with this? Well, there was the uh, problem solving of atomic transitions where I modeled the process. Then there was the photoelectric effect, uh, both on, so the one was unit one day eight slide 10 and the other one was the unit one D nine slide 11. Uh, the solar cell problem on the practice exam was also exceptionally similar to this particular problem. Uh, problem six was again identified as one of the easier ones by a lot of folks. So here you've got uh, the n equals two and the n equals three uh, waves. And basically you're gonna go through them and see which are true. Uh, so the first one is you are more likely to see the n equals three electron at 0.05, so that's here, right, uh, than 0.22. And that is not true because, remember, these are the wave functions, and the probability is related to psi squared. And when I square this, it'll go positive and be bigger than that point at 0.05. There is a distance from the nucleus where neither the n equals two nor the n equals three will be observed. Yes, that is true. There's this point right here where they are both equal to zero. 
the n equals two electron will never be observed at a distance of less than 0.1 uh, nanometers from the nucleus. Uh, that is not true. We can see the n equals two uh, wave has some probability has some value less than 0.1. The least likely spot to see the n equals three is about uh, the 0.22. And that is also going to be false. The, the wave function has some value there. In fact, as we already saw, it's more likely than the 0.05, so that's that's fine. The probability of seeing the n equals 2 at 0.9 is exactly 0. So let's go out to 0.9 and have a look at what's going on. And nope, that, that's not 0, so that's OK. And then the n equals 3 electron will sometimes be observed closer to the nucleus than the n equals 2. That is, in fact, true. Uh, these are probabilities. And I might see the n equals 2, for example, uh, out here, and the n equals 3, say, here, in which case the n equals 3 does appear to be closer. Uh, unit 1, day 4 had a whole series of questions related to this. Slide 10, slide 11, slide 12, slide 13, slide 14 were all related to this type of problem. Uh, problem seven was also identified as one of the more challenging problems on the exam. This was, what's the lowest possible energy photon in the universe? Um, so if I have to fit the photon in the universe, that's sort of your clue that I should be thinking about in lambda over two equaling L. Uh, I gave you L the size of the universe, and the lowest energy state is one. And so from there, you can calculate uh, lambda. Uh, lambda will be uh, 2L, so twice the length of the universe. And then E is HC over lambda again. And from there, you get the correct answer uh, was this one. And partial credit was given here. If you were off by a factor of 2 in either direction, I gave you partial credit, so in this case, uh, D and, and B. If you said it was a quarter wavelength or uh, one wavelength, I gave you some partial credit. Um, what were the places to start with this? Uh, unit 1, day 9, slide 19 is where we really identified that the lowest uh, energy, the longest wave, is twice the size of the box. Uh, there was a next time problem that same day on uh, unit one, day nine, where you worked through the energy levels for a photon in a box. And then, of course, the answers were there at the beginning of day 10. And this uh, wave was, again, thought about on day 10, uh, slide eight there, the, the butadine, where you're looking at that uh, longest wave. I thought problem eight was probably the hardest, personally. This is the, the double slit problem. So electron fired at my slits, and there is a laser which sees which slit the uh, electron goes through. If the electron is seen to go through this slit, it'll begin to populate dots as a shadow behind that slit. However, if the electron is seen to go through this slit, it will turn into a wave, which will then go through both slits, forming the characteristic uh, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark pattern behind those upper slits. So we started this actually on the second day of class, unit one, day two, uh, slide 14. We saw that you build the pattern up one dot at a time. Uh, there was some summary drawings on slide 16. And then unit one, day three, slide nine, the which way problem uh, was related to this. So problem nine, so nine through 12 were identified as kind of a challenging series for a lot of folks. So these were our x-rays. <clears throat> so here's the first one of what is the wavelength if the emitted, uh, if the target was tungsten, like was in the picture. Uh, once again, we are starting with conservation of energy. So E final 
E initial. And what are we looking at? Remember, we are looking at this electron here falling in after this electron has been knocked out. So our final energy is the minus 67. Our initial energy is the minus 7.98. And that gives us the energy of the photon that is released. I told you it was released. So there's the negative sign for the photon being emitted. And from there, you can calculate the wavelength is D. Uh, so problems that were related to this, uh, there was a logging on problem of unit one day eight, so slide three, where we were looking at the energy levels and photons within energy levels. That one was absorption. This one is emission, but it's the same idea, just run backwards. Uh, once again, the problem solving strategy here was laid out on unit one, day eight, slide 10. Uh, the photoelectric effect was again, more practice for y'all on this. And once again, that solar cell problem on the practice exam was, was quite uh, related to this particular problem. You had two energy levels and you were in that case, again, you were talking about absorption instead of emission, but you know, just run the other way. So for 10 and 11, uh, I'm going to talk about these together because they are kind of a pair. Um, so if I change the initial potential energy of my initial electron, so this thing here that falls down, what is going to happen? Uh, well, one electron kicks out, one incoming electron kicks out one inner shell electron which then an outer shell electron falls in and I get one photon out. So increasing the energy of this incoming electron doesn't change squat. So everything stays the same. In both cases here, because the energy of the X-ray that comes out is given by this transition from the outer shell to the inner shell, which is unaffected by the energy of the incoming electron. Uh, now, if I went from tungsten to molybdenum, which I'm probably mispronouncing, but give me some slack on that one, what's going to happen? Well, once again, the number of x-rays isn't going to change. One incoming electron yields one x-ray going out, but so the number of electrons will remain the same, but the wavelength will get longer. Why will the wavelength get longer? Well, the difference in energy for tungsten is smaller than that for, uh, sorry, the difference in energy for molybdenum is smaller than that for tungsten. And so jumping straight to the expression that most of y'all saw from general chemistry. If delta E is smaller, the wavelength will be longer. And uh, this was really discussed at length on day eight with all the problems on the previous slide, but sort of further reinforced with this, how do we know what stars were made of discussion that we had and uh, phosphine on the atmosphere of Venus that we had that same day. Uh, slide 12 was about uh, imaging and, and what you might want to use. So uh, the imaging part was unit one day seven, where we talked about the wavelength has to be small. But if we are interested in fine detail, we need a small wavelength, as we talked about on unit one day seven. So for that, we want tungsten, because as we just saw on the previous slide, uh, molybdenum gives us a longer wavelength, and we want a short one to see fine detail. So teeth, tungsten, because teeth are small and the things you're looking for are small. Um, however, too much energy can give you cancer. And so if you want to look at sensitive tissue prone to cancer, say uh, breast tissue, which is prone to cancer, in that case, you want a lower energy x-ray. 
and that's where the molybdenum will come in. So these are actually different uh, sources that are used in different x-ray machines for different purposes in the clinical setting. Uh, problem 13 was this uh, 135 hexatrine thing, uh, exceptionally similar to the 13 butadine that we did on unit one, day 10, slide eight. Uh, the basic idea is the same. So how did we do that? Well, once again, we're starting with conservation of energy. So E final, E initial is the energy of the photon. Although uh, in this case, uh, the photon has to come in to cause the jump from the n equals three state to the n equals four state. And then we can use our particle in a box expression, h squared, four squared over eight m l squared, h squared, three squared over eight m l squared is the uh, energy of my photon that comes in. The mass you're going to use is the mass of an electron because that's what's jumping up and down. And the length of the box was given in the problem as 0 0.14 nanometers. And from there, you can get the energy of the photon and from there, the wavelength. And the wavelength came out to be uh, 231 nanometers. Uh, as for drawing, so I guess that was part B. I guess I did B first. For part A, uh, you're in the n equals three. What does that look like? Well, your principle there is in lambda over two equals L uh, with n equal to three. So reading this out, I have three half wavelengths in the box. So something that looks kind of like this is what you're going for. Could have been like that, could have been inverted, could have been this, that's fine too. Any of those are acceptable for part A. So that concludes our debrief of exam one. I, I hope you found this exam to be helpful. Um, and I hope that you uh, can use it to improve and enhance your studying for the next exam. This concludes this video.